Engagers, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights and inspiration to help us in the process of using games and gamification in our daily lives, for example, to learn what we are teaching. And I am Rob Alvarez. I work at Ironhack, teach at IE Business School University and so much more and host this podcast. If you have an extra second, please go ahead and subscribe for free to our email list at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Well, Engagers, welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game podcast. Today, we are with a very special repeat guest. We are with Professor Lee Sheldon, who is back on Professor Game. Before we kick off, Professor Sheldon, are you prepared to engage? Yes, I am. <laughs> Let's do this because as you know, you know, if you want to hear the full episode, you will definitely find it. You type Lee Sheldon on the search bar in Professor Game. You'll definitely find our first episode where we talk, you know, all the start standard questions that you love, you know, about the failure, big success, the process, all of those things are definitely there. But we are back today because we're going to be talking about Professor Sheldon's new book. As you know, he is a game writer, designer, educator. His full bio is going to be on the show notes. Uh, he, until recently, he was even a professor of practice at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, author of Multiplayer Classroom Designing Coursework as a Game, which uh, has a second edition from 2020. The Multiplayer Classroom Game Plans, which was just published in June 2021, and Character Development and Storytelling for Games, which is in a third edition coming for 2022. Plenty of interesting stuff. Some commercial video games that include The Lion's Song, Suburbia 2, Disney Fantasia. That's how we pronounce it in Spanish, so I'm probably giving you a terrible pronunciation. Music Fantasia Evolved. Fantasia in Disneyland. Fantasia, that's it, that's it. Music Evolved in Xbox. He has designed classes as games, and you have a bunch of examples in the show notes. But let's get right into the meat. Professor Sheldon, we're going to be talking about your book today. But since we spoke last time, like a year and a half ago, besides, of course, from the book, has any other things been happening? Any new games you've been designing for the classroom? Anything you want to quickly comment on before we go for the book? Uh, no, I've been busy writing these three books since 2019. I am no longer teaching at Worcester because I just have too much work <laughs> to do in addition to educating people. And in addition to writing the three books, I, I, you know, we're a little early or else I would have something rather large to share. Hmm. But I, ha I have something that we still have to sign some contracts on, so I don't want to say anything yet, but it's, it's going to be lots of fun and I uh, hope everything goes through with it. And that, that's all I can say. It's a it's a video game, <laughs> as you Exciting. might have guessed. And, and it's not an educational video game. It, it's a uh, commercial. Nice. Sounds very, very exciting. And I hope we get to hear some news from that soon as well. So getting into the book, as you were saying, you've spent all this time, you know, going for the books, the first edition of Game Plans, the second edition of Designing Coursework as a Game, and the third edition of Character Development and Storytelling for Games. You've been investing a lot of time in that. So the first question, the natural question here is, why did you shift your focus so strongly into your writing, into, into improving your books and writing a new one? What, what, what was behind that? Well, uh, the, the first two, well, actually, no, uh, the first one and the third one, we're getting old. Um, <laughs> the first edition of Multiplayer Classroom, Designing Coursework as a Game, came out in 2011, and I finished writing it in 2010, something like that. And quite a lot has happened in the last decade. Same thing with character development and storytelling for games. The first version of that came out in 2006. And then the second one came out maybe 2013, 14, something like that. And as you know, things go pretty swiftly in the game industry. And my examples, for example, I didn't want to be citing decade old games or even more unless they were there's a particularly distinctive reason for doing so. I wanted to apply the teaching to the games that are as close as possible to what the students might be playing. For example, I finished the Nintendo Switch game, something, what is it, of the wild? Breath of the Wild. Jeez. Breath of the Wild Zelda. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that took me a long time. Then there are that 
was came out what five years ago maybe hmm. so even that you know and it but it took me a year to finish it i can't play uh, the way i used to 24 hours a day unfortunately i actually have to act like an adult occasionally so yeah, they force us into that yeah so that really it's bringing them up to date in in terms of i know we're going to talk about the second one but the third one character development and storytelling for games Really, there's. Uh, I used to. I, I noticed in in the uh, the last volume, I was calling everything a computer game. I now call them video games, because computer games are really a subset of that, and they didn't used to be. And so there's also different types of games, uh, MOBAs, you know, that we didn't have even that long ago. And I need to talk about writing for all all these new kinds of things as well. So it's really updating the two that bookend the one that we're talking about today, which is a first edition. Very, very exciting. And and I have to say, you're you're mentioning the mobile games. I had like for the first maybe three to four years of mobile games, I couldn't find the interest in it. <laughs> like honestly, mm-hmm. they, they didn't catch my eye. And I'm a video game freak. Like I loved PC games, console games, like everything, like most things that caught my eyes, I I, I at least laid my hands on them. For mobile, it's like, you know, it's a small screen. It's not really comfortable, you know. <laughs> I, I used to like the Blackberries because you could actually type on uh, the old ones that had the, the actual keys and, and you were typing on them. So I kind of was able to map things well. So I didn't like, it didn't catch me really until I started playing. I think the first one was a zombie game, of course. I, I really enjoy zombie stories in general. But then now I'm playing Clash of Clans like every day. <laughs> It's crazy. And I love it. I have a clan. I have, I have friends I've never met outside of the game. So I literally don't even know their real names or anything. So it's caught my eye. And I have to say, I've updated myself as well as a player in that sense. So it makes a lot of sense, like updating those things and understanding what the universe is saying is doing right now. Where we are now, how, and how we're, how, how are we telling our stories through the games? And there's just, a whole bunch of new stuff and that's and so got to keep up and and what do you feel has been like do you have an example or something of big that has changed of course like mobile going to mobile is a big change but from the perspective that your 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 main perspective which is definitely writing games and 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 creating the games themselves how much is those you know principles and those things that you create to use to create games how much has that changed? And, and if you have an example of how that changes, of course, beyond the examples themselves. Yeah, I don't know that it's necessarily changed too much because I need to do certain things when I write a game. And with some of the new formats and some of the new hardware, it's just a matter of finding out how to do that. Hmm like writing for the Facebook game and the limitations of Facebook, for example, huh. and what was expected at the time from Facebook players and so on. And I mean, you can't do the, the uh, Facebook uh, version of War and Peace. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think. It would take you a long time and the battle scenes would be real small. So it's kind of identifying how to use the same rules that are important to telling a good story, but in whatever medium you find yourself in, whatever type of game. That was, that was my initial feel. I, I had my hypothesis that, you know, the, those principles that you've been using haven't changed much. It's just about adapting to the new medium. Of course, as you were saying, like Facebook, but also mobile, the, the size of the screen and how much maybe text you can add there as well. Yeah. How do you do those things? Of course, it has to change, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's um, look, some of these things go back to, you know, the ancient Greeks <laughs> and Aristotle <laughs> that we're still, I'm still paying attention to Aristotle. He won't shut up. And so as a result, I mean, the, the unities, then there's, and he did more than that. Then there's Aristotle and then there's uh, some other Greeks. <laughs> and those guys were writing a long time ago. And not interestingly enough, not just talking about writing, but thanks to Plato, we know that actually the ancient Egyptians were teaching math through games. Mm, there you go. And so, hey, and we think educational games uh, came ar- along pretty recently. No, there I've, I've got examples that go back centuries. And of course, Plato is a few centuries ago. So, 
Very nice. Very nice. I did definitely not know about the Egyptians teaching math with games. That is exciting, to say the least, <laughs> and inspiring as well. There's also the philosopher John Locke, who yeah. talks about creating games to teach. <laughs> uh, more in theory, I don't know if anybody listened to him. I think he's a pretty cool guy. But um, <laughs> he, he talks specifically about how games could be designed to teach things. And, and he was in the, the what, the 1600s? Yeah. I'm going to show my ignorance here. But it, was a lot, it wasn't as far back as the Greeks, but it was a ways. Yeah, it was a way back. Definitely, definitely very important stuff going on around history. It's, and again, going back to it's, it's a bit more of a personal thing, like back in school, especially, I really didn't enjoy history a lot. Like it was probably my worst subject as far as me, me, me being entertained and enjoying it. And like literally after I graduated school that I never had to see history again, I started enjoying history. <laughs> like, I saw, you know, I, I started reading books that were a lot more interesting than the ones that are the formal ones that are supposed to teach you this and that. Of course, I didn't have to memorize any dates. <laughs> so I'll probably be having the same problems as, as you remembering <laughs> when somebody is from. It's also that, of course, whenever we're told we have to learn something, <laughs> we go, oh, screw that. But then when we decide to choose to do it, somehow it works better, right? Yeah, I, I, I even be, like geography and all those things. I like really, I never, never enjoyed like social studies in general. Never. All throughout my school, I, I entered 18 years old and I didn't enjoy that. I got to the university and started going to model UNs, for example. And I knew the capital and the president of every country in the world eventually. <laughs> and of course, you, you get into that and you start reading history as well. So I, the first thing I went into was the Middle East, especially like re relatively recent history and understanding what happened there with the creation of the state of Israel and all those wars that happened. It was so interesting. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It, it, it was such a game changer for me. One, of course, not to have to learn any of any, any of that, but then seeing it from another perspective, like from the story and not well, history has many cool things, but when you, when, when you see it in school, history means, oh, which river goes through which state and how does it, you know, uh, how many states does it cross? And like, it's kind of more math than, <laughs> than history. And I'd like math, don't get me wrong, but uh, I don't know. It, it was just memorizing and memorizing and memorizing over and over again. And not knowing that story of what happened there, what are the important facts like what, what, what were the lives of people like back in that day? What changed with, you know, whether it was a war or a revolution or a new invention? Like that, that's what I find so exciting. And that's something that I do think we've lost quite a bit in our educational system. Probably no, no matter where you are in the world. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. And actually, I'll throw in something here about the fourth book I wrote during the, the pandemic. Thank you, COVID. Nice. And that is, it, it's a mystery set in the 1700s, late 1700s in Bavaria. And I, so I did lots of research on it that I would never have done in school, <laughs> right? I just, I looked for everything I could find about that period and the section of Bavaria, the towns that I was writing about and trying to make it as realistic as possible. And that I just I have actually have just completed and I have to uh, actually see if I can get that published now. <laughs> <laughs> Next task coming up. <laughs> yeah, must, mustn't forget that. It's important. Absolutely. We'll, we'll definitely have some space to talk about that as well, um, eventually when, when, that's, when that's coming up. But Lee, let, let's focus on game plans for a second. So okay. we've been talking about all these very, very interesting subjects uh, regarding, you know, around all your books and your writing and how you, you know, like COVID was definitely part of that inspiration, updating the books. But then as well, you have a completely new book. I've been going through it. I haven't finished it yet. That's a live confession here. Um, it's a long I, book. <laughs> yeah, but it has, like, I do feel at, at this point, I, I do have the chance of, you know, re you read the first part, understand how it's structured, and then you go, can go back and forth and jump around in the book. And that's mostly fine, at least as, as, as far as I've, I've been going right now. In the examples, of course, you don't go to the middle of an example. Maybe it doesn't make as much sense, but you can jump through the examples and it should be, as far as I've done, at least up to, up to this date, it does, it does make a lot of sense. So... What is this book about? I gave a, a very brief outlook at, at, at the examples part, but what, what is the book about? If, if, you, if you were pitching me the book or, or just talking about it with general audience, what would you say this book is actually about? I'll start with what it isn't. It's not the multiplayer classroom, <laughs> which was about 
me teaching stuff. The idea uh, in behind game plans is that I was not the subject matter expert, that I had to work with someone who was, and how do you do that? To make sure, because, you know, the writer, game designer is going to think he knows how to do, you know, to teach something, and the teacher is going to think they know how to design the game, and what you have to do is make sure that people know their roles and understand what the roles are and work together, and it can work quite well. That was the first thing. So it's about collaboration and how you can collaborate. The next thing is I had budgets for these games that I did not have when I'm doing my own classes. And so how was the money spent? And then the structure of the book is uh, four stories, really, uh, kind of like pseudo design documents. I, I, I made them simpler than what a real design document looks like. But to sort of say, okay, this was the collaboration. This is what we started out to do. This is how we prepared to do it. This is how it went. And then did we succeed? And all of those stages I thought were kind of interesting and could be um, put into, into the book. And also the fact that I got to talk about stuff that wasn't just screenwriting, or not screenwriting, uh, game writing and game design and level design. These are the courses I taught, right? But that were te was teaching kind of a, a range of things. Each one had either a grant behind it for, for money or there was money from the institution where it happened. So what they are, are like roadmaps and histories of what happened, what was going to happen, what was planned to happen, what went right, what went wrong, and in some detail, because I thought if I left out the detail, people wouldn't quite understand what it all meant or what all was involved. And I so I chose uh, four out of the, the ones that I've worked on because they were very different and because each one of them had its own challenges and had sort of a different approach. Although you can see as you go through the book that I, I do go back to favorite kinds of things and I can uh, talk about those later. But um, so we had four subject matters, physical education and fitness, Mandarin and Chinese culture, the culture on the internet, and finally cybersecurity. Uh, something that's really uh, kind of important in the news right now. The internet game was entirely online, which also made it interesting for this period of time to be writing it. And how, what I could do online to keep the students involved and, and so on. So each one is sort of the story of these games. Absolutely. And, and as you can see there, I, I, one of the things that I love about the fact that it's four examples, well, there's several things like, but one of them is the fact that they are so different subjects, because what happens sometimes when you see examples from people is like, oh, yeah, I'm a social studies professor and, or a teacher and I did this. And it's like, oh, yeah, but that works for social studies very well, whereas my subject is so different. And so, so you kind of break the mold there of saying, no, 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 this is not just for this or that, you can see here four very different things for very different examples where you can say, look, you know, you don't have the excuse of this is not exactly your subject. It is clear that it could be your subject as well. So that's one thing I love very, very much of, of the way and the intention of the book that I completely love. Another thing, and, and, and you mentioned as well, is the fact that the book has to do with the previous point. It's, it's about examples. Because one of the things that happens very, very much is that, especially when people have client work, this tends to be like very, you know, you sign an NDA and the client is very jealous about the information to be shared. And here, you know, you're literally sharing almost the full, a simplified, but almost the full design document that you did to create this game. So you're giving a lot of detail of what goes into this and how it could actually look. So th those are two things, just two of the things that I really have enjoyed of the book to this point. So thank you very much for that. I don't know. How, I don't know if you have any any sort of way of complementing this. I said or, or completing it, um, but th those are definitely two of the of the things I really enjoy. It 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 helped. There are a couple of things um, that I didn't mention. One is that there are forwards to each of the games by the subject matter expert. 
so they got to talk about how they felt the games went. But the other thing is I highlighted specifically things that went right and things that went wrong, sort of just holding up flags and saying, just watch out for this. Be very careful about this one or this surprised me that it worked, <laughs> you know, uh, and those are the sort of the extremes. But everything uh, in the middle is I it gave me a chance to reflect on these games because these games are done. A couple of them are still being taught, but they're I'm out of, you know, I'm out of the the loop on it and so they're continuing but I learned and the teachers learned things that I wanted to have in the book too so the things that went well and the things that didn't go so well yeah that's always neat to see and it's one of the reasons I like to kick off one of the questions which is all about failure and knowing what did not go right for two reasons well I'm going for two reasons today I don't know why but one of them is definitely showing what are some examples of things to, to sort of say, hey, watch out, this could happen. And the other one is definitely to show that superstar guests like Professor Sheldon also get things wrong, and that's okay. I mean, we can get things wrong. Professor Sheldon can get things wrong. It's about how we take lessons from that. And it's part of what we teach, why we want and we, why we like to teach with games. Because with games, you go the wrong way, and then you try again, and you go the right way. And that's fine. It's what we do in games, isn't it? Our, our, we wipe out a whole guild trying to kill a, a, a boss mob, and then we, what did, what happened there? Let's not do that. Let's not just run up. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's plan things a little bit more carefully. So that's essentially that's one of the things that that how I teach all of my games is to learn through failure, but we don't call it failure. It's why, going way back to the other book, uh, yeah. why I call it XP, you know, instead of giving them, you know, minus X number of points, they only get plus numbers of points. So, so that it's a reward instead of a penalty. That's such a simple thing and so few people will do it. I don't know why. Well, we, we also, I mean, sometimes you do have like some open space to do a bit as you want with your grades, but not everywhere. <laughs> I can talk from experience. I mean, sometimes you have your hands a little bit tied, but there are many things you can do. Even with that, there are many ways, you can things sneak, you can do. sneak around anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's <laughs> so much that can be done for sure. Just a quick break before we continue. Are you enjoying this podcast? If you're listening through a podcasting app, please subscribe and rate us on the app. This will be of great help to reach more engagers so we can change the world together through gamification. So, Lee, the other thing that is sort of the obvious question, but I do think it is very important, is you've, you've gone from writing your own experience and you creating games. Of course, then that, that sw switched as well into you having experience on the other side. Is that the reason why you wrote it? Because it's not just about what you do, but actually sitting, as, as you very well know, so sitting down and writing a book is a big task. It's a bit big ask as well. I'm not sure how financials are going for you on that side, but generally books are not necessarily like the, a big profit center for most authors, at least. This book is, is to help people. And because I thought that people would find it interesting to see how these things are put together. These are all alternate reality games in one form or another. And they all had their, uh, their benefits and the, their issues and, and things like that. And I wanted to sort of look and see how they really went because the physical education game was a number of years ago now. And just, you know, I can learn from it again. Oh man, we tried that. That's a stupid thing to do. Why did we do that? And also to share some of the really amazing things that that came out of uh, the collaborations and out of the students playing them the i can't remember the exact number but at the end of the physical fitness game one student had had covered 240 some miles and in seven weeks so it spread out and it but it that's just what a number playing the game on foot because that was the intention of the game was to get them fitter without making them, you know, run on a treadmill or something. And here was here were people that were doing it because it was part of a story, because there, there were sprints and things they had to do, uh, competition, and they had to figure out what the mystery was. I'm a mystery writer, so each, each game has some mystery in it. 
And that keeps them going because they want to find out what's going to happen next. And then on top of that, they get rewards for their, you know, divided into small teams in that particular game. And the teams, if a team does well, they get their, their pictures on our fake website from one of our characters saying, these people helped me and they did this. And, you know, I'm all about intrinsic rewards. And, and that's a good one. Besides the added addition of they got physically fitter. So Absolutely. all of those things are voyages of discovery. And the first time I try something, it doesn't work. I, I may try it again later on. There's a couple of places in here where I deliberately, I'll give you an example. Um, in the internet game uh, or class, it's always entirely online. Um, but I have them f f facing off, the students facing off against an unknown villain. And at one point, the villain messes with the website that is used for their class. And I, <laughs> I thought, and that worked pretty cool. So I got even, I, I tried something even more dangerous in the fourth one in the cybersecurity game, where I had the villain in the cybersecurity game erase all their grades. Mm. And uh, we had an admin server set up that was ours. It wasn't the real schools. So we could do that without really touching them. But, you know, that got their attention. <laughs> <laughs> even, though they, even though they knew it wasn't a game, we were hitting them where they live. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it actually worked quite well. So I had actually started out and tried one thing, and then I just escalated it a little bit uh, to try it again. And the other thing I did in the uh, Internet game, which was entirely, you know, I'm always experimenting. So... And this particular, um, this, this came out in 2014, I think, 15, something like that. And th this was for a school called Excelsior College where the students would not meet. They could be all over the planet. And they only put up either an avatar of them or, or a picture of themselves. They could do either one. And so you didn't actually see the real people unless they decided to put up a picture, which is what two people did who weren't real. I created <laughs> two students and they pretended to be students in the class. Now you would have thought this would have gotten me in a lot of trouble, but actually I used them for two reasons. One, to be on opposite sides of debates because you don't want to just give one point of view. And sometimes when a teacher gives two points of view, you can tell which side they're on and so on. But to have two people, even if they're non-existent, have wholly committed views that are diametrically opposed really worked well. And they were also a hint system so that none of the people in the class would fall behind. They could, you know, they would know who wasn't there and everything. And, and, and so they could, in, in talking online, which was through text, they could um, help people move them along. So it, it, we didn't have to break the game for a hint. We didn't have to slow down the game because there was a discussion that wouldn't go forward. We used those two characters and it worked really well. In the cybersecurity game, the TA for the class is also a character. He's, he's a real student there and he was a real TA there. But he turns out to be an FBI agent, and at one point he gets kidnapped, phys physically kidnapped by the uh, – I shouldn't be giving away all these things – but um, <laughs> by the villain, and the students have to track him down. So they also got some exercise <laughs> there too. So these were all different sort of experiments that I got to work with to see how they worked out. And I, there was a problem with that game because we had an orientation – as we do for all of them, this is a game. We say that out loud. You can't, you know, just start it and they don't know. And, and we had an orientation for this on the first day. And a student missed that day. Ooh. So we come in and all of a sudden the students are learning how to hack into um, websites on the dark web, which again was on our servers. There was, we, we didn't take them really out there. And then there's obviously this, this um, hacker who's trying to infiltrate uh, the computers at the school and eventually does, but also just down the road from the school, this was for uh, uh, California Tech at, at um, 
San Luis Obispo. And just down the road from there is the Diablo nuclear reactor, which is the last nuclear reactor in the state of California. Mm. And it turns out the hackers trying to hack into that. And so, you know, you escalate the, uh, the the tension a little bit with that. But anyway, those those are just, you know, some the, the kid missed all of the explanation. This was a game. So he comes about a week into it. He, he comes running in the professor's office. He says, Professor, what's going on? Shouldn't we tell the administration? Isn't, aren't we what, what we're doing illegal? <laughs> and uh, so um, he, he settled down once he learned that it was a game and everything. But those are some of the pitfalls that you have to take into consideration and you have to be careful about. You know, you have to keep them enclosed in your world with all the rules that that world has and as much as you can. And it, work, it works quite well, even for the uh, Mandarin game, which never leaving the classroom, we took them to Beijing mm. and, and, and the Forbidden City. So that required some imagination on their part. But playing the game in that case, they learned, uh, I think, I can't remember now, it's in the book, but the teacher who also played the teacher in the classroom and was a character said that they learned in eight weeks, I think it was, a full 14-week four, semester of Chinese. Ooh, interesting. And this is an example of how committed they are and that or were. And that was that they were told they were going to go to Beijing. They would be met at the Beijing airport. Remember, there's, they're not leaving the classroom for anything, anything for this. We're just moving chairs and stuff around. And they're told they'll be met there by a professor who will take them to their hotel and make sure they get settled in and everything. Well, the first thing they had to do was clear customs. Oh, I should add that in this game, we had a group of, of Mandarin-speaking actors. And I put actors in quotes because there are people from a local community center uh, we had maybe eight or ten of them, and uh, they played different characters in, in the story and did a great job. But the customs officer is sitting at a desk. They come into the, the room, and they have to get their passports checked. They were more like papers. They weren't really real passports. And then they had to exchange money. They had to find out where their hotel was, how they were going to get picked up, and all, all those sorts of things. But they'd be helped by this person. Well, they cut, they clear customs, and the person who's supposed to meet them isn't there. Oh. There's just a, a crumpled sign on the floor that says, welcome students. And so they have to do it on their own. They have to go through all these stages so they can get to their hotel on their own. Now, each one of those things is I created was like a puzzle, right? They have to figure out how to call, you know, call in Chinese and all these things. And... I had it planned that it would take the full two hours of the class. They finished all my puzzles in an hour, and then wow. they could have left, but they didn't. They started asking the NPCs, do you know what happened to the guy who had this sign? They used um, phrase books at that point because they were going way beyond what they were supposed to learn for the lesson, right? And they were practicing their pronunciation, and all of the actors, I think in this particular one, there were f five or so stayed in character, spoke only Mandarin, and if they didn't understand, you know, the, the students would try again, and the students spent the next hour trying to solve the mystery of why somebody didn't show up. And then they were sad when we, we said, hey, class is over. <laughs> you have to go home. <laughs> Come back next time. Yeah, but it was it was just that they were so involved in, in that particular situation. It wasn't my plan at all to have that happen. But they stuck with it for another hour on their own and used a phrase book and helped each other and questioned as much as they could each of the characters. It was great. That sounds absolutely fantastic. And it is one of those great examples that you can find in the multiplayer classroom game plans <laughs> by <laughs> Professor Lee Sheldon, for sure. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm joking about this, but definitely I have the book at home. It is definitely a book to read. If you haven't read the previous book, maybe you want to start. Well, does that make sense to start by this book? I think it's, it's, it could be two different audiences, in which case it doesn't matter. But most of the, what I, I'm seeing are most of the people that bought multiplayer classroom designing coursework as a game wanted to sort of really see what it's like to have a full flood fledged game much, you know, on a much higher level. And then other people just want to see what this is all about. 
So I think that if you're going to read both of them, it's probably good to read them in order. First, the multiplayer classroom and then this one. This one is, I think, more fun in terms of, of how it's it's written. And I do I have lots of anecdotes, like I've been saying here and so on, so that they can, I think, get a real feel for what it's like to put one of these games on and also to play it and also to learn from it. Certainly. So I don't know that there, I, I think I, there's probably the needle swings a little bit towards reading uh, them in order that they were uh, written. But on the other hand, I think you can go either direction, but you should read both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I have to agree. Definitely. Great books, great examples, you know, great material that you, that you have there. So definitely engagers. If you haven't picked up those books, those are definitely books that you want to pick up. They make a lot of sense. I know most of you are involved in some way or another in learning and education. This is exactly, exactly for that. It's about games in the classroom and multiplayer games, which, you know, it's, it's a whole, you know, set, whole new set for cooperation or competition as well, but throughout, you know, people interacting within their own classroom. So thank you very much for that, Professor Lee Sheldon. It has been a pleasure to, to have those books out there. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you here. I don't know if there's any, of course, you know, where we can find the book, where we can find out more about this, if there's any, you know, web page, if there's any, I don't know, Twitter or anything, anything else? They're published by Taylor and Francis and uh, uh, a smaller publisher under that umbrella called CRC Press. I noticed they're also on the Rutledge website and they're on Amazon. I don't know other than that where to find them, but they're certainly out there in the world. Given the current circumstances, Amazon <laughs> with online shipping and all these things is, is one of the main places you want to make sure it is because it's what most or, or at least a huge chunk of people are using these days. I definitely am. Like I'm an addict at this point of <laughs> ordering yeah, online I know. almost everything. We're everything. giving him all that money so he can go into the outer space. Yeah, for sure. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> Hopefully that'll be useful for us. Someday. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, they're out there. Taylor and Francis is a major publishing house in England and all over the world. And so it's not hard to find the books. I'm sure. I'm definitely sure of that. The fact that I live in Europe as well. So it, was, I, it found its way to me for sure here in Spain. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways to find the book. Definitely find it out there. As you know, you can also find Professor Lee Sheldon as well in many places over the internet. I don't know if there's any one of them you want to highlight. I know last time we mentioned, I think it was your email and something else. If you have questions, you can contact me on LinkedIn. There's a Facebook page, although I don't go there very often. <laughs> the If you have questions, specific questions, then uh, multiplayerclassroom at gmail.com will get to me as well. Fantastic. That is fantastic. Absolutely great people have any doubts, especially once they've bought the book, if there's anything that is not clarified, this is great feedback if that is the case um, or anything that you want to dive deeper onto, or maybe even if you want to work with Professor Lee Sheldon on a grant, as he was mentioning before, and creating a game for your classroom. I don't know if that is the case, but you know, you have all those sorts of ways through LinkedIn, through the email and so on. So once again, thank you very much for investing this time, not only in the interview, because thank you very much definitely for that, but also in writing a book, because those are fantastic ways for many, many, many people to be able to access all of that beautiful information that you're giving away in the book. If there's nothing else, which I, at least for now. Now you finish that book. Yes, of course. It is literally the book I'm reading right now. I, I'm not reading anything else at okay. this point. Okay. <laughs> So every every Good. leading I'm gonna, minute I'm gonna that come I have, find you if you do. <laughs> <laughs> literally, okay, literally cool. home address you have it right now. So <laughs> you know where to find me. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Thank you for the book. I have to say publicly, Professor Lee Sheldon sent me very, very nice of him to send the book over so that I could read it for this interview. I, I've spent a lot of time, all of my reading time lately, in fact, reading this book. I'm finding it fascinating. I go over some of things more than once, which is one of the reasons why it takes me longer than some other books, because I want to make sure I'm capturing, I'm absorbing everything that I can from the book. But at least for now and for today in this podcast, in this week's episode, it is right now time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to Professor Game 
podcast. And as you know, this podcast makes sense, especially with you, the engagers. So why not? Let's connect on Twitter, which is where I'm most active on social media. And you can let me know who would you like to have as guests. If you have any questions, any doubts, anything that's troubling your mind, we can talk about it. We can hack it out there on Twitter. Let me know what I can help you with. You can find my Twitter account on professorgame.com slash Twitter. I'm always sharing content on gamification, education, game-based learning, game thinking, especially around learning, as you know. And hey, before, before you click continue, remember to subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.